thoughts of liberation as the Germans promised to leave no evidence of their crimes behind. As the British and Canadians swerved toward the Zyda Z, the Americans crossed the Elba and the Russians the Oder. Germany is crumbling. As the Allied armies surrounded German forces, SS guards fled from concentration and labor camps killing tens of thousands of Jews in the final weeks of the war. The day before liberation, we were digging our graves. That was the order. They kept repeating it. You're not gonna get away. You'll be dead before they get here. forest, there were three factories in this forest. They were bombing all night long. But uh, we were glad that they are bombing. We didn't care even if we die. morning and we didn't hear any wake-up calls and no dogs barking it was totally quiet we took the shovels that we used for our graves to dig under the fence I was very skinny and very little and I was the first one to get out of the camp there was nobody around me who would stop me I started to walk alone it was a beautiful spring day the sun was getting up on the horizon, and that's when I said, I am going to hold up this sun, so never let it go down. That was the first morning. The rest of the day wasn't so great. It was long ago in the spring of 1945, but we'll never forget it. We saw liberty. It was a rush of excitement. It was a feeling that couldn't be controlled because it had been controlled for so long. When we looked out of the door of the barracks, we saw a man wearing a completely different uniform than the Germans. And then all of a sudden, more came and they start to scream, British, British, British. They told us that they are our liberators. In April of 1945, American, British, and Soviet troops liberated concentration camps across Europe, including Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, and Sachsenhausen. We were liberated by the Russian. The day of liberation was May 8th, my birthday. I was 19 years old. They opened the gates, 
and they set you free. From the 5th of May, the American army arrived here, welcomed by every capture. They made from us people again. They brought us food, white bread, potatoes, eggs, sugar. God bless you. I'm glad we're here. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I am the officer commanding the Regiment of Royal Artillery guarding this camp. Our most unpleasant task has been making the SS, of which there are about 50, bury the dead. British soldiers who liberated Bergen-Belsen were greeted by 27,000 unburied corpses. <laughs> The German SS carried the dead bodies on a big pile. I said, we cannot let them carry the bodies, and I start to scream. I start to walk to carry the bodies and put them on a big pile. the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. I was liberated in January 45. That's when I went to the Russians. I was scared of the Russians because I didn't know what they were going to do to us. When they first came in, they raped a lot of girls that were left behind. But I became a nurse in the Russian army. Allied soldiers had silenced German guns. But Allied doctors still fought against the death the Germans had left behind. Typhus and dysentery were as common as a cold in the nose. I was a skeleton and physically completely broken. The Red Cross doctors gave me a blood transfusion, and the numbness dissolved. Liberation did not come quickly enough for many. Of the 55,000 prisoners liberated at Bergen-Belsen, more than 13,000 would die in the next 12 weeks as a result of their years of mistreatment at the hands of the Nazis. I stay in Bergen-Belsen till beginning September. Most fantastic experience. We were loaded on wagons in Germany after labor camp because the Russians were coming from one side and Americans from the other. We went to the nearest station. From there we marched into Theresienstadt. To us it was like coming home. The elation you cannot imagine. Well-intended liberators told their survivors, you're free, go home. That moment was one of the saddest, most difficult moments of my life. I know that my mother did not make it. My sister never came back. I have no idea what happened to my father or my brother. So what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go? Having the Germans gone, the Russians there, and not having food were pushing us into survival mode. And we went and looted the city. When I broke into a house, I destroyed whatever I could. I just had to express my anger. I stole a white tablecloth, an apron, because girls wore aprons. A little cup, and I thought we could make Kiddush. It has the initials of EF, my grandfather's initials. So I thought I had a right to have this cup. I walked into a restaurant, and the restaurateur asked me, are you coming from a camp? And I said, yes. And he says, go in the kitchen, and they will feed you. 
I said, we have six people out there. Uh, we all are hungry. And they fed us. We were Orthodox Jews. So we broke into a butcher store. And I took this half pig and I carried it back to this house that we decided to occupy. Fifteen of us camped out in the hallway. And my mother said, OK, we're going to cook it. And it smelled horrible. And of course, we haven't eaten for a long time, a heavy food, and we all got sick. The military did not know how to feed us. They want the best for us. So the condensed sweet milk fed food which we could not digest. We were hungry and couldn't eat. So there were sicknesses because of the food. The civilians were leaving town already, and believe it or not, I felt so sorry for them. They were carrying their bundles like we did, their children. They were walking out of town. And I even told my mother, I feel sorry for them. And my mother just looked at me, how can you feel sorry for them? The fact that the war was over and we kicked out the Germans and kicked out the SS from Theresienstadt, all that was happy. Then, of course, the curtain fell, everybody gone, nobody survived, everything gone, stolen. Where do you start? Then it began, the homeward trek. Home was Holland, or Russia, or Belgium, or Czechoslovakia, or France. We did not have a home. We don't have four walls. We want to look for our loved ones. We did not know how to start it. Some 11 million people were displaced in Europe with very little support to help them return home. With a complete breakdown of European society, there was no way for survivors to know if any of their family members remained alive. We didn't know where to go, who was waiting for us, so we went in groups to the forests. And the forests were very dangerous because they were dynamite. We walked and walked and walked for days. Sometimes we slept where the cows are. We had sore legs, but we walked. People ask, did you feel hatred or anger? That was not on our minds at the time. On my mind was, how am I going to survive now? All the train tracks were bombed. And trains were sometimes coming, sometimes weren't coming. We got out of this station, and we were looking for food again. There were no people around, these destroyed cities. And we're walking, and there's this plaza, and there are two old people killing the lice in each other's hair. I felt ashamed looking at them because they had no humanity. They were old, and, and that's all they had, each other and the lice. I remember coming back to the station, and I said, we have to go. We have to get home. We have to get back to normal. He spoke Dutch. I went right to Amsterdam, to the train station. I got off the train, and I was all by myself. And a policeman came up to me. So I said, I was in a camp, and I want to go home. And he said, where's home? We headed back to Prague, where I came from. I knew that there was no home anymore that was gone. I was standing on Wenceslav Square, no money. Where could I go? It was the most shocking moment. My cousin came down and I said, where's my mother? Where are my brothers and sisters? And he started to cry and he said, there's nobody came back yet. With train tracks often destroyed by advancing Allied troops or retreating German forces, 
Survivors had to overcome incredible obstacles as they tried to make their way home. The train rides were amazing, but you never were inside the train. You only sat outside the train, whether it was on the bumper or whether it was on top of the cone. A hundred mile journey takes days instead of hours, and the ordeal is one that only the fittest can face. decided that we're gonna go back to Poland. Perhaps somebody's alive. So we went from one train to another. We arrived after one month and we went to our home. And this was a disaster. When we went back to Mishkos, it was not a victorious entrance into a city which was waiting for us. The population said, why did you come back? More came back than left. You want your stuff back, you're never gonna get it. The Polish people wouldn't let us in our house. They were wearing our clothes. They had children, they went to school. They had babies in the baggies. And we were orphaned, homeless, hopeless. So we sat on the step and cried. Violence against Holocaust survivors was widespread. Several thousand were killed upon returning home. They caught two Jews and they blamed them for black marketing and they tied them to a horse and buggy and dragged them through the city. And of course, they were killed. We have a lot of anger. We did not know how to use this anger. Facing no other choice, many survivors returned to Germany to live in displaced persons camps. I was very angry. And when I arrived to Germany, I hate them so much. I hate the ground, the bloody ground. I hate every person. When I was riding in the streetcar and I saw an American soldier was kissing a German girl, I'm ashamed to say, but I pushed out from the streetcar. I couldn't calm down myself. I think if I had ground, I would kill lots of people. I just couldn't forgive him what they done to us. Everybody who survived went to the railroad station every day to wait not just for your own family, but for anybody who came back. Every time a train came in, I would go to the station and see if any of my family came back. I just was hoping my mother would be there. And she was only 48. My brother, he was married, had a little girl. And I was almost sure my oldest brother would come back. I never expected my mother. And I didn't have much faith in finding my sister. But I was hoping that my brother and my father would maybe survive. The anticipation of knowing that now we'll find out who is there. And the joy when we arrived to the station in Mishkos, my brother was there. I never found any of my family. And I had a huge family. I never saw anybody come back. According to a post-war survey, 75% of the survivors were the only member of their family to survive the Holocaust. There is a school in Budapest where survivors register. And I stayed there all day long reading names, hoping that I'm gonna find somebody I know. There was not one name that I recognized. So it got late afternoon and we decided we're gonna go out and see if we can find some food. And I reached the door and the door didn't open because somebody was pushing it from the other side. So I stepped back and the door opened and my brother stood there. We just held on to each other and cried. Entering Auschwitz on January 27, 1945, Soviet troops only had to open doors to storage buildings to reveal seven tons of human hair, 836,255 dresses, and thousands of pairs of shoes. The scope 
of it. We realized after the people were coming in. When around that six million of us were killed, I just can't believe anymore. I don't believe anybody. I did break down when I heard how my father and brother was killed. But we hardly talked about all these aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents who disappeared from our lives. I stopped counting at 50, but those were cousins and second cousins and numbers. The only one that really meant a lot was my father, because he was all I had. The rest, there was no mourning for them. It was sad, we mentioned it, we counted them, but it, you know, you adjust to it. My brother and I found my father in the tuberculosis sanatorium called Kutch. He asked me whether we were at home and whether I saw in the backyard a little aluminum milk can. Well, when the Germans came into Hungary, they dug up the backyard looking for, I guess, treasures. Then the Russians, and sure enough, on top of all this mess is this little milk can, and there is 300 American dollars in it. We lived on those 300 dollars for a long, long time. My father died four months later. You lost everything, not only people, but your apartment. Even the money was changed. I thought I was going back to the same world I left, which of course I did. Nothing was as it had been. Kids didn't go to school as they should have. Parents were not with their children. It was a crazy, upside-down world. I was angry that I can't give back what they done to us, that I can't get back my family. And I kept going back to Poland. Why did I go back? I had to come down. I said, come on, Rena, you're free now. You better be nice. I found a job with Hyas, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. They needed someone speaking English, which I was fluent in. We processed thousands of immigrants who left DP camps and emigrated. Countries outside of Europe did not open their doors to survivors. Strict quotas kept many from finding new places to call home. As soon as we saw the destruction of our homes, we were too scared to stay in Mishkorts. So we moved up to Budapest, where there was more of an organized Jewish life. The Jewish community now set up a community kitchen, and they wanted my mother to manage that. And Russians came to eat that. But the Russians didn't just eat, they drank. And they become very vicious and crazy. And so I always had to hide, because they liked Jews. Barishnya, Davai Barishnya. My brother and I bought up a lot of English parachutes, which were made of pure silk. At that time, it was fashionable to have these full circle skirts, and we were painting the skirts and selling them. We were doing pretty well. Kids could relate to other kids, only among ourselves. We were not exploring it with adults. Our doors were locked. There was one night when we were around the campfire and started to deal with it. What's our role now? What do we need to do to prove that we are worthy of survival? So we kept asking, how do I fit in now? And that was a little bit of mourning. Otherwise, we tried to just stay, quote, strong. You would be surprised how quickly we adjusted to a happy life. We had fun. I was 23 years old. I was still a kid. Maybe I had a body like a woman, but I was still an uh, innocent girl with no experience. I just didn't want to have anybody. I had a boyfriend, and his sister was a seamstress, so I had beautiful clothes. I didn't have anything when I came back from the camp. He was not Jewish. He was gentle. 
later, one woman said that, you know, he was gay. And I said, he was nice. <laughs> That's why I liked him. You wanted to belong to somebody. My brother had his girlfriend, and they were going to get married. And here I was. What am I going to do when they get married? When Emil came to town, he was the leader of the organization. It wasn't like a romantic relationship. I wanted to get his attention, so I wrote to him, i like to meet with you at this and this time, on this and this corner. It has to do with the organization. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and he saved that note. We received the note on a big bulletin board. I saw that Schlama Meisner was looking for me. Schlama Meisner was my good and close friend in Pietrakov ghetto. We worked together in the underground and we started to love each other. So when I saw the note, my life changed. I met Bernard before the Holocaust. And I visited my brother at the first labor camp in Hungary. And he started to come around, and later we got married. Schleimerschuk, a blanket, and he made me a jacket and a little purse. I was so thankful to him for it. And we make the legal our status. So Schleimer was my husband now. My future husband, Fred, told me that my father was dead. So I went from the arms of my father to Fred being with me. Wedding, we met at lunchtime, went to the city office. Two of his colleagues were witnesses, and we took them to lunch. Not a flower in sight. It was not uncommon for there to be six or more weddings in a single day at a displaced persons camp. He came to Marburg from Munich. He told my sister he wants to marry me. And there was 10 people at the wedding. The dress from a parachute and the veil and the flowers was from a Christmas tree. I married him in Marburg, 1946. And I went to Munich and life was hell. There's this everyday saying, oh, we want to show Hitler that we live again. No. These marriages happen because of the big hole in our life, the loneliness. We did not have anybody. And when we found the same person with the same experiences, we have this bond and we hold him to it. It was 1946. There still was anti-Semitism going around. I just didn't know how to take that. I thought, shall I go to the United States? But when we were liberated, the Americans in the army, they had segregation. And that's one thing I didn't like. The people I stayed with, they said, well, we're going to immigrate too to America. We don't want to stay in Holland. There's nothing here. I had my visa in three months. I intended to stay at Prague. And then two years later, the communists came over. So everybody rushed out. I had my visa in three weeks because I was born in Germany. We waited three years for that quota number. My daughter was nine months old when I left Prague in 1948. Just had my daughter, so it was difficult. I had to stay in Germany five years till I got the visa to come to here. In 1950, the Korean War started to come to us. Europe was wondering, or we will have a third world war. So we were all ready to run from Europe again. We received our affidavits and we went to Detroit. the Statue of Liberty and into New York Harbor sails an army troop ship with over 860 refugees from Europe, victims of Nazi persecution. 
Many of them spent long, terrible months in concentration camps. But this is a happy day. I had three cousins waiting for me on the plank when you come off the boat. Relatives and friends are here to meet the newcomers, and they get a welcome they'll never forget. America opens her heart to those who long for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I was happy to see them, but still I was kind of scared. America was a dream for us. When the boat came close to the Statue of Liberty, we cried. My heart was going like this. Our ship arrived just as the World Series was going. And there were some Americans with little radios listening to the results. In comes Snyder, followed by Torello, with the two runs that tie up the ball game 3-0. It made an impression. <laughs> This is Manhattan, business center of New York City and heart of the city's life. Millions pour into the area every day to work and shop. But where do all these people come from and how do they get here? We stopped at Rumpelmeyer's. My friend told me, try a Coca-Cola. Perfect refreshment every time. There's nothing like ice cold Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola I ever drank and the last one. And she said, order cinnamon toast. And that I like. That was the specialty of Rumpelmeyer's. The plentiness of everything. I couldn't get over it. Go to a store and see all the food there. All these newspapers and magazines. I felt overwhelmed by it. Hurry, 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 hurry. The world is so full of a number of things, and we don't want to miss any. I didn't like New York. It was too big for me. I had to go underground, and every time I put money, somebody else went before me. I was still not sharp enough to know what's going on. I flew from Prague to Paris and from Paris to New York City. My brother-in-law drove us to Allentown, Pennsylvania and he drives into the driveway, and I see two little children in costumes. And I say, why are they dressed in these costumes? It's not Purim. And he says to me, no, it's not Purim, but tomorrow is Halloween. I came to Hoboken, New Jersey. It was dark and dirty. And I said, this is America? As a child, when you hear America, you dream it's all fairy tales. Cinderella and princes, and everybody lives in castles. September 24th, 1950. My cousin set up the chuppah and we got married in his living room. He said, you have to have guests because they will give you presents. And he invited a bunch of people who I didn't know, but my mother couldn't be there. And Emil didn't have siblings. This is not how it's supposed to happen. Everybody wanted to make some kind of a life for themselves. They didn't talk about the camps. They just want to blend into the American crowd. Whenever I mentioned anything about the concentration camps, stop, don't talk about it. You're now in America, forget it. What bothered me was my only living uncle did not ask so many questions, and I came to the conclusion that he was afraid to know. Later, when I met a cousin who took us under his wing, he started to ask questions. And when I told him that after the war, we looted the city, he was horrified. That was not right to do, to steal. That shut me up. That was it. I knew I couldn't talk because we were judged by the standards that they had. and didn't understand what other standards were there. 
the war was behind me. My war was struggling where my next $15 will come from to pay my room. I wanted to go to work. There was a little Italian foreman in Felix menswear in Allentown who saw my picture in the paper. And so he gave me a job hand finishing the menswear garments. He was a wonderful little man. I had a job a week and lost it. Had a job for two weeks or three weeks and laid off. It was a bad time. It was a recession and New Yorkers are very tough. That was the worst time in America for me. I didn't want to stay in New York. So I didn't make lots of connections because my sister lived in California, in the Valley. My husband, Emil, got a job in the Valley. He was the principal of a Hebrew school, so I thought that we hit the jackpot. My aunt insisted that we come to California. My husband said, California. My cousin said, Uncle Yap had a diamond factory in Santa Monica which is the nicest place to be, and that's where we're going to move. One of our good friends decided to go to Los Angeles, and Schleimer said that's a good occasion to close the door of Detroit. Train Travel USA, America's best buy in transportation. We took a train ride from New York to Los Angeles. It was a very luxurious train with a sleeper, so it did not remind me at all of the car. <laughs> the train stopped and it was staying for a long time. And they said that a little girl fell into a well. The eyes of America turned to these rescue operations in San Marino, California. Down this tiny 14-inch pipe lies the body of three-year-old Kathy Fiscus. Since Kathy fell, she has been heard only once. After 42 hours, the 94-foot mark is reached. By nightfall on the third day, her body is recovered. The world salutes a brave endeavor that ends in tragedy. I thought to myself, look what they are doing for one child. And here in Auschwitz, thousands of children were murdered. I remember the day when we arrived, the sky was so blue. People were walking around without coats. It was winter time. And I saw this I never saw palm trees before. And I see this beautiful country from the top of Coldwater Canyon. And I said to my husband, I never leave here. Greenery in front of every house, which doesn't appear in Boston or New York. It's just the opposite of what it was in New York, where everybody looked into your face and you had no space or air. Here, there was so much space and so much air. It was wonderful and it was also something that you couldn't hold on to, like being in space floating, rather than holding on to a building or something. We walked up and down streets in Hollywood, saw a little single, but it was $85 a month, and we had 105 So we walked some more. It was a heat wave in March, and in the end, we came back and took this apartment. I had a cousin here who was a doctor, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he had a friend going back to Europe to find out whether anybody survived. We right away had a beautiful home to live in, no rent. That was a wonderful beginning. Flourishing in peace with 67 million people gainfully employed, the United States today represents an achievement in good government that ensure the great majority a way of life that is physically gratifying and spiritually uplifting. My husband went to look for architectural work and I was looking for secretarial work. I go to this agency on 7th Street and she said, yes, I have a job as a showroom secretary, 608 South Hill. Vogue Optical, it was called, and it was selling frames. These mamzelles have an eye for what's chic. Their vision is 2020. Never mind the other measurements for now. Styles range from the streamlined to the daring and dramatic. With or without glasses, there's no denying the eternal feminine. 
it turns out they come from Pilsen where my grandparents lived. Small world. I went to a real estate agency and it was pretty insecure work because I was the only Jewish girl there. I just didn't trust too many people. I looked around and I saw the poor, I saw Beverly Hills, but I was always nervous. I never knew who was behind me. There was constantly the memories were haunting you. You wake up in the night, I was crying. I had very tentative connection to other people. I didn't feel I fit in. You feel always an outsider. We didn't have a great circle of friends. We were very happy together alone. We were independent, struggling very much. I built a friendship with a colored lady, a nursery school teacher. And I said, come over, we'll have a cup of tea. She said, no, I'm not going to white people's houses. I could not comprehend this. I joined an organization which was called Shelters for Israel because they were Hungarians who were here during the war. We didn't keep in touch with the immigrant group. It was more important for us to have friends among the Americans, and we joined the couples club. Well, that was the most distant group that I could be in. I mean, I had no relationship to that group, but we meant because that's what you're supposed to do. When I went with my Bohites girlfriend to movies, I see in Hollywood beautiful women. I said, can I ever look like them? And she surprised me. She wrote a letter to Columbia Go. And one day I got a phone from the studio. From Hollywood, glamour capital of the world, we present Glamour, Glamour, Glamour Girl. The program where every day we take a lady selected from our studio audience the previous day, and in the following 24 hours, we glamorize her into an exciting, thrilling, brand spanking new personality. Next day, they cut my hair and the makeup in the studio, and they got me the clothes. And I was on television, and the whole Bo Heights, they still call me Glamour Girl. On Pico Boulevard was a movie theater. And on my day off, I still learned a lot of English from going to the movies. And across the street was a little coffee shop. The guy was making his own donuts, and he introduced me to Eli. And Eli said, I'm going to marry that girl. This dream house you and I will share was planned for us by Bridget Dare. I really can't believe my eyes in every room. A new surprise. I married him after six months in my cousin's house because my mother-in-law, she was from Russia, and because I didn't speak Yiddish, I wasn't Jewish. Here on a warm January day, the sunshine is glorious. No wonder Los Angeles is the promised land for migrating millions. Not one person asked me, what happened to you? They were so reluctant to even mention that I was in the concentration camp. And so how can you feel well when this major thing in your life is not mentioned? When everybody kept telling me, leave the past behind, I felt maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Starting a new life, being in a free country, and do what you have to do for the future. These are USA in your Chevrolet. America is asking you to call. Drive your Chevrolet through the USA. America's the greatest land of all. Yeah. It took us a month or two before we had enough money, $300, to buy an old Chevy. It looked like a bomb. We bought a green Chevrolet a year after we came here. 1950, I bought a Chevrolet. Big, beautiful Chevrolet. Remember, more people buy Chevrolets than any other car. I believe in assimilation. To a point. Assimilated American, I wish I could feel it now. 
I am so anxious to put out the flag because I want to be sure that they see that I am an American. In a world torn between forces of freedom and slavery, I am an American takes on new meaning. I received my accreditation from the Bureau of Jewish Education to teach Jewish schools. I actually wanted to be a doctor, but I was too old, so I went to School of Social Work for 11 years until I got my master's degree. My schooling was interrupted. I wanted to be a nurse, but I also had to make a living. Somebody introduced me to a young man whose name was Rudy Gunreich. He was a Viennese dancer, and he decided that he wants to design the costumes for the dance group. So we made these costumes, and then he also was friends with Stroheim, and he hired Rudy to design for a film with Lana Turner. And of course, Rudy said, Rene, you have to come with me. We were immigrants. I mean, the whole country consists of immigrants. I didn't think I was an immigrant. I was a Hungarian Jewish survivor. As an immigrant and a survivor. More like a newcomer than a survivor. That word survivor never occurred to us. I had to take the bus through Westwood, and I saw a sign, nursery. So I got off, and I told them with sign language. I said, me, from work, babies. And they gave me a piece of paper. So my cousin called them and was a movie star. Ricardo And Georgiana, Ricardo's wife, said, something tells me I want her. So my cousin said, she doesn't speak English. She says, okay. My husband don't speak good English either. I wanted to learn English, and I wanted to fit into the American way. I just felt that everybody felt so secure, and everybody was so self-assured. I liked that. <laughs> 58, we became citizens. Many of those taking the oath are newly naturalized citizens and the last seven Hungarian refugees who have sought freedom on America's shores. When I got my citizenship, I had this feeling, now I am in America. Your vote is your chance to do a really important job for your country. Your vote could be the one that counts. See you at the polls. I voted in every election, and this so did Fred, my husband. In the little Cumberland, Pennsylvania Township voting headquarters near Gettysburg, America's first citizen signs the register as the nation goes to the polls. Together with the first lady, the president is among the early voters. His Democratic opponent, Adlai Stevenson, arrives to cast his ballot. At the four corners of the nation, democracy is at work. We listened to Stevenson and I liked him. I've talked with small businessmen all over the country who get smaller and smaller and poorer and poorer, while big business gets bigger and bigger. He's the one that I voted for. We had great respect for Eisenhower. He was the one that liberated Dachau, and he brought in the citizens of Germany to look at the dead people that were all over the place. And then he brought his military people over. We continue to uncover German concentration camps in which conditions of indescribable horror prevail. I made this visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things. If ever, in the future, there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. And he said, I want you to remember this, because there will come a day when people will say this never happened. I had mine qualms about having children. I said, what for to bring children in this world? It still was a wall between the real world and our world. It was criminal to put children in our world because we had absolutely no one. If something had happened to us, my husband was 52 when she was born, and I was 37. That's old. I 
I was a little scared, but I was grateful that I'm gonna have a child in the United States. Many people lost their first child. I had a baby. He lived only three days. It was a very big tragedy. It proved that the future cannot be better than the past. I face the loss of that baby, and then I go back to work. You can't mourn when you want to live. When I was pregnant, Fred wanted me to stop. I've never worked since. I was always home when she came home. Helen was born in 1953. This was the big events in our life, a colossal happening. I was ready to face the world again. I think when you have children, you change. You completely become a different person. You have something to care about, somebody to love, somebody to one day you get love back, and this is what life is. When the children were born, I think we were all relieved and happy and joyous. We didn't allow the sadness to move in until mostly when we were more normal life. Not when we had these joyous celebrations, although we did talk at that time about our losses and when we told people how they were named. Eli said, whatever you want to name them, your family comes first, they've been killed. In the Jewish religion, you name your first child after if your parents are dead. But I feel differently about the death of my parents and the death of my sister. My father had papers for us to come to the United States in 1937, just before the trouble started and my mother refused to come. But my little sister, 16 years old, innocent, why didn't she have the chance I had? I had a vision that my sister came to me and told me that I'm gonna have a little girl and I must name her Clara after her. And I did. All parents have the anxiety. But for us, it was a repeat, almost like expected that something can happen. I wouldn't let him out of my sight. I never had a babysitter. When Stephen went the first day to school, I didn't leave that gate. I stayed there till he was in and he come out. When the kids were younger, they started dating. I slept on the couch. When they arrived, I opened the door and I went to bed. I was never overprotected. She will confirm that I was a tough bitch. <laughs> and she turned into a very wonderful girl. In my Jewishness, I don't flaunt. In the beginning especially, I would hide it because I was sure it would create some problems. Stephen wanted to go on the Boy Scouts. That day they called, they were going to pick him up. I didn't sound right to pick him up. The truck reminded me of the truck that picked me up. A day of worship and of dedication for Boy Scouts of many faiths. Onward for God and my country is the theme of the encampment. And I saw these kids had brown uniforms. And I said, is that what you're going to give my boy? And he said, if he's going to be taken in to the Boy Scout. I said, oh, no, he's not going to Boy Scouts. Forget it. They look like little Nazis. Ein Volkswagen. Einen Volkswagen. When we were on the freeway and there was a Volkswagen behind my car, Benji, who was the second child, said, Mom, the Germans are after me. Trashed. It took probably a long time till we trust people. We did not trust ourselves in the beginning. We must realize that we were six years out of normal human life. Damaged, yes. It changed our attitude towards many things. When I worked at Kaiser, all the cases of loss will refer to me. I never told them that's what you should do. I had a kosher business, a deli, and a restaurant. Then my husband used to work there, and the kids, I had somebody home to give care of them. I worked from five in the morning to midnight. 
I made all European food. I had a very successful business. Is this crepe? Yes, it's uh -huh. a crepe chic, uh -huh. panel back, reversible dress. Let's see another crepe dress on that wild Arlen. Well, we call this the Roaring Twenties. Oh, Renee, what a fabulous dress. The Saks Fifth Avenue really believes in this look. I was in every major department store, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus. Wish you could see these colors. Renee really believes in colors. We were promoting colors. Because the world was drab, and everything uh, seemed to be sad and, and depressing, so we wanted to, you know, color it up. I began to feel human when on my clothes there was a label which said Renee Firestone. Then I kept saying to myself, well, this is not a 12307 anymore. This is me. Your great-grandson and his mother are going to have Thanksgiving dinner with us. Did you ask, Lisa? No. Bob did. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. I was in New York uh, buying fabrics, and one of the secretaries ran into the room and said Kennedy was shot. When Kennedy was shot, I remember how we all cried in the car. A shocked nation weeps. I was so shaken up by that. It destroyed my fantasy about America, which was a point of security for me. Those who sell and all who manufacture what is sold know that American women often have the deciding voice in whatever we come to buy. I couldn't imagine that in the United States some people live on the streets and don't have what to eat. After the war for quite a few months, I lived like homeless. Why can't you do something for the poor people when they sit on the streets? I was there. I know what is to beg for food money. You have the power to help. Why not? Since the rights movement was a wonderful awakening for all of us. The promises of the great society have been shut down on the battlefield of Vietnam making the poor, white and Negro, bear the heaviest burden, both at the front and at home. On Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, I used to cook big pots of food, pack it in my car, and we fed the homeless. My children never asked questions, and I never told them. I remember there was some program on television, and they were quite young, and I made them watch it. It's very hard for certain people to tell their young ones about their awful life. They have certain secrets. Not everything can you share with your loved ones. I never much talked about the whole experience, but Paulette always had Jewish friends. You absorb it if you're not dumb. I think they just lived in our house and breathed it in. Clara says, I remember when I was about five years old, we were on the bus. An American soldier asked you, Miss, what is that number on your arm? And you said, oh, that's my boyfriend's telephone number. I was in the Navy and I put <laughs> my number on the arm. And she says, I knew that that's not true. I knew you were never in the Navy. In late 60s, I went to Camp Ramah and I became a counselor and a teacher. 
The kids wanted to know what their tattoo was on my arm. So I told them the story. We started to talk to Helen when she was three years old about our experiences on her level. And I used the same method with the children in nursery school and kindergarten later on. Clara started to ask questions when she was 14 years old. She said, you know, mother, um, all my friends in the school have grandparents. What happened to my grandparents? And then she went to the library and educated herself. The grandchildren are a great joy. And look how many triangles you have. They wanted to know, and they asked me to sit down and tell them. The way they relate to us, the love and the affection, which our children could not express that openly, is such joy. My grandson, every time we were together, he had questions for me about life in Czechoslovakia, certain camp situations, always questioning. And every time there was something said, he would come and put his arm around me without saying anything. Uh, it moved me incredibly. My grandchildren went to Auschwitz. They know their roots. They know who they are. They know who I am. They tell me, Baba, we love you. What does it mean to hear this word, I love you? Our grandson, because we were quite open about what he went through, wrote a little essay, What is the Holocaust? We were not only numbers, but we looked like this. You will tell that you talk and so a survivor which told you the story of Shoah. The Holocaust miniseries, that's when it started to be a conversation. There was an opening of the door. It's an extraordinary story of courage and heroism against the odds. What has he done? Why are you taking him? Routine questioning. No, no, no. What is his crime? Of course I saw it. Very well done. Trains aren't going to Russia. Where are they going? Treblinka. It's a death camp. Holocaust survivors didn't care much for it because it didn't really portray the reality of the, of the concentration camps. But the fact that somebody even thought to make a film about it, and that the public at least remembered through that film that there was a Holocaust, was very important. The young generation, for their benefit, should learn from our tragedy. Because what happened once to us can happen again. The only alternative is tolerance. The Simon Wiesenthal Center was coming to Los Angeles. And the rabbi explained to me that they need somebody to tell their Holocaust stories. And I said, I don't think I remember anything. And he said, last night in the valley, one of the Jewish cemeteries and a Jewish temple was desecrated. Hate shows itself in an ugly form with a swastika on the glass door near the playground of a Jewish synagogue. That night, I had a nightmare that I was in Auschwitz. The ground was blood red. They were pushing and shoving us, the couples. Suddenly, I woke up screaming, but they told us never again. And I called back the rabbi and I said, you know, don't count on me because I don't know how much I remember, but I'm willing to try. And that same night, he took me to a Mormon temple. The church was packed, and they were showing a film called Night and Fog. And I see these bodies being bulldozed, and I went berserk. I started to cry, and I couldn't stop crying. The lights go on, and I started to talk. 
And I'm telling you that I have no idea where those words were coming from. We are the witnesses, and we have the mantra of telling. I was with my Kim sisters, and we don't know who will live. Each one of us said, when one of us will survive, we need to tell. And I try to keep to the promise that I will tell. We start speaking in schools and churches. I'm begging you, the ground of Auschwitz is bloody. And I have to remind you not to let anybody build or destroy it. It's a cemetery for the whole world, for our children. Everybody has to go and visit. And the ones who say it's not true, we'd be glad to take them in a cattle train, bring them there, live in there. I felt so proud that I, the Polish refugee, came to this country, and I can come to Sacramento and speak for the people. This was my thrill. You would have thought this overwhelming tragedy would be the last. And look at it. We're going through the same things. We have dictators again. This is going to forever pursue us. I don't think teaching this, that, or the other about the Holocaust is going to make the slightest difference. I am very frustrated about what's going on in the Sudan today, in Darfur. I think it's an outrage. Cambodia, Rwanda, Kosovo, you name it, nothing. Didn't people learn anything from World War II and from the Holocaust? After I retired from designing, I devoted my time to the past. Good morning. In the beginning, I didn't care if they want to hear it. And as you know, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I wanted to tell because I felt that the world is beginning to forget. Humanity is responsible for what happened. Now it is really an obsession. I speak almost every day because of that. I read Franz Werfer's The 40 Days of Musa Dag, and I learned about the Armenian genocide. And I couldn't get over it, that it happens to some other people, such things. That's why I keep talking about it. It is a psychological need. I don't want to stay isolated. I want to be connected to the world. And if you understand, I'm connected. If you can't understand it, I am alone. The list is an absolute good. The list is life. Schindler's List had done a lot. Testimony of the people will do much more. Among the many who were liberated from the concentration camps was a 20-year-old girl from Czechoslovakia. She is here with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Renee Firestone. I was asked, would I come to Washington to present to Steven Spielberg? Well, I couldn't believe that. I thought that somebody's playing the joke on me. Those of us who survived the Holocaust we're worried that soon our stories will be forgotten. But after Schindler's List, a miracle happened. You, Stephen, created the Shoah Foundation and recorded tens of thousands of survivors' testimonies. Thank you for what you have done for all of us, and of course, what you have done for history. You are our hero. Thank you, Stephen. We also were invited to the White House, and I kept thinking, would my parents believe that this is happening to me? This means in all our frivolity, we have a certain sadness. Things can get faded, things can be forgotten, and that's a danger when our memories fade. People were asking me, why don't you take your number out? 
How can I remove this number? This number is really the Holocaust. This number is part of me, which will never leave me. I never did put the wall behind. To this day, I'm not pathologically connected to it, but obsessed by it. saw the barrack where the latrines were, where you have 200 holes next to each other. That expresses the humiliation and the infection. But it also expressed the community. The 200 holes brought us together and that we were able to talk to each other. That place, the only place where we felt we would not be overheard or punished. No one can understand what we went through. Americans cannot imagine it. If they didn't live through it, they can't understand. The chimneys were burning 24 hours a day, and the smell ate itself into our flesh. For years, I could smell it on myself. I don't think a normal person could ever understand that a thousand people are pushed into a room where they know that they are going to die. I don't even want to think about what it was like for my mother to be in a gas chamber fighting for a breath. Was she thinking that her children may die the same way? That haunts me even today. I went to every block all over, and I said, did it really happen to me? I'm just dreaming. That wasn't a dream. I went back three times. The last time, I said goodbye, Auschwitz. I will never come again. Every time I see one of those trains, I thought, oh my God, that was pretty terrible, but I never think of it. I don't know, maybe I'm superficial. I don't think so. But uh, what, what's gone is gone. I, it, I put it behind me. I'm not going to dwell on things that make me miserable. I always have nightmares, you know. I dream I'm back and I'm digging the ditches. Last year, I went to see the Sinai. I was in the ER room, and to me, it looked like Auschwitz. I saw a door, and it was the door from Auschwitz, where you had to go through. I saw a guy sitting there on a chair. I thought it was the guy that put you to the right or the left. And I had a German nurse, a little blonde, and her name was Gretchen. So I grabbed her and I said, now I got a chance, I'm going to kill you. This is Auschwitz. If I go, you go. And they got me off of and of course, they tied me up. They said, I don't know anything about it. I was two weeks in the hospital. I don't remember anything. The last survivor of the Armenian Holocaust passed away. And I was thinking about us. And then what? And then what? There is this emptiness, like a, a big hole. It is an impression that's physically imprinted in my body. It's a pain that's in your mind, really. It almost takes your breath away. I guess I still carry it in me. It probably is imprinted in me that I have judgments which other people don't have. I am dealing with the mark that I am a survivor. I went through a period in my life which was destroyed. I witnessed 
Yes. So the destruction of a culture which was in bloom for a thousand years, and especially the last hundred years. We thought that we can build this up, and we failed in it. And I cannot come to grips with it. Where is home? It's an interesting question to ask when I'm 86 years old. Home is a sacred place. What it looks like or what it has is not as important as the stability of it. Now, as I think about my death, I also think about my past. I think about my childhood almost like a dream. Each time I went back, I lost a little bit of that unity that was my family. I couldn't see it as the home that I used to live in. So it doesn't exist. My husband, I already had a lifetime with him. Fighting, loving, yeah. we took the whole game. Mainly fighting. <laughs> <laughs> He died in a home with a family. My mother and my father were murdered. It's a totally different feeling. I keep thinking about my parents, that they never have a chance to know me. They really never had a chance to know who I was. <laughs> When you're 90 years old, <laughs> the uncertainty is right there. <laughs> I am not afraid of that. I know it must come. With all the tragedies in my life, I had a full life. I love life. I love uh, the curiosity of life. I like every day of life. I like the sunshine. I like the rain. I love the falling of the leaves. I love every minute. I would not change my life, not one bit. I wish, of course, always, that my mother could have seen me married and have children, and that she could see the grandchildren. My granddaughter, Kelly, she's already 33, but so I live for that. All my kids, after they got married, they lived with me. Nobody left me until they finally... I never said, you got to get out. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole shebang can move back in. <laughs> I'm very excited that I live to 80 years of age, and my husband, 86. They will be able to have two children and grandchildren. And this is the best thrill of my life that I live to see a fourth generation. And I hope that this baby one day will see the film and will learn by his grandmother what she accomplished in her life. I made an appointment for a physical and they found I had cancer of the lung. Within a week, I was operated. And I'm one of the 5% who survived more than five years. It's 13. So am I lucky? Dear mom, you've reached a remarkable milestone on so many levels. Happy birthday and many, many more. I am a fatalist. I accept my fate not only because I survived and I'm still functioning at 92. I mean, somehow I was lucky. There is a joke about the German Jews. When they went to Israel, they always said, by uns, at our place, this is how it was. But the same is with us. It's like how it was at home. Now, at home, how long did I live there? 14 years, 15 years? Why is it still my home? Why was that life more important than my life now? It shouldn't 
color everything in my life now, but it does. So when I'm homesick, I can't find a place where I'm homesick for. I'm home where I am. Okay? Thank you. 